it's November the 15th. It's Bitcoin Cash Fork Day. Don't ask me what Bitcoin Cash Fork Day is. <coughs> if you have to ask, you shouldn't know. But, uh, no, it's a nice day. There's some very, very high and some very low cloud. Good day for filming. Oh, hello, jogger. Good day for flattening a jogger like a hedgehog on a right hand bend. It's a bit big for a hedgehog. So, I didn't mention in my last video, and by the way, these videos are going to be uploaded late. I mean, I know that. And the reason is that my main computer at work, I do everything on. I do, it really acts as the server for the uh, data, for the, for the patient data software. It, uh, and it's my main computer for writing letters and uh, doing anything else, you know, that I want to do. It's got a reasonably powerful graphics card in it because I do uh, smile line ortho and uh, they do 3D projections and so you have to sort of have a computer card that's capable of rendering stuff and and doing it all in 3D and it's the same with the um, the implants you know you have these 3D scans back so anyway what was I gonna say yes no so the reason why is I've been getting blue screens of death this is on Windows and uh, you know I think it's related to the the, uh, the fracas that they've you know fricassee whatever you call it with the uh, update, the, the autumn update, and the fact that it got postponed and everything, and I think it's a bit buggy. So, anyway, uh, I was getting these blue screens of death, and touch wood, I haven't got, you know, one for a week or so. But I had to pull the memory out and see if it was a, seemed to be like a hardware, it was like a hardware fault, you know? It was like it just struck completely at random. Um, so, I've had to sort of stick to, trying to just make sure that the surgery is functional I just because you can't if the server reboots itself then all the terminals crash this systems for dentists has got this quirky and rather endearing feature that if the server goes offline for more than a second then then you have to reboot all of the terminals they're not they're not at all capable of recovering the state they're not stateful so um, you know, it's very important that the server doesn't crash. Now, <clears throat> um, most computer people will tell you that if you're going to run a system like that, the, the server client setup, then you should the server should be left alone. You should hum away in a cupboard somewhere, and you shouldn't, uh, you know, it should be left on for two or three years at least, and not uh, be touched. And certainly shouldn't be your work machine. You know, the one that you're doing all the experimental stuff on, and and. Uh, you know, doing uh, redesigning practice leaflets and things like that. So, anyway, um, so and because rendering these videos is one of the highest problems that the graphics cards have. You know, the, the, in terms of computational power, it's one of the biggest uh, jobs. So, I sort of cut down on doing it because I, I used to do it in between patients, and now if I can't afford the server to crash in between patients. So I'm sorry about that. You'll just have to get them when you know I manage to get them done. I've got a machine at home I could use, but I can't. I can't upload them from home. My home connection is too slow to upload them. It, whereas it, it could be left to um, crunch them. Whereas the one at work is the only one that's fast enough to upload them, but is uh, flaky. And the alternative is to sort of swap the data between them, but I'd have to do that on a memory stick because don't forget the the link, the link, the computer link at home is too f slow to upload them to work. So I mean, if I can upload them to work, I might as well upload them to YouTube. So um, you know, I'm in a problem. I don't, I don't want to go home, spend an hour of an evening editing a video and rendering it, and then stick it on a USB stick and take it to work, and then copy it across and upload it and everything. Just that just makes the whole thing too complicated. Anyway, you may be having the same problems. I hope you're not. The um, what I was going to say, which I sort of didn't mention uh, on the last video, is about the uh, 
GDPA, DPA, DFO is that um, uh, I've, I've uh, decided to embark upon this project to um, archive all the records. Um, in an, and there's, there's a fair old, I mean there's a few old cardboard boxes of records. Now fortunately I've got a scanner that's very um, quick. Uh, but it's still going to be a mammoth undertaking. I'm a mammoth task. It's like literally, uh, you know, I mean, there's boxes of this stuff. And, uh, you know, it's all, a lot of it's all stapled together and there's no point uploading it if it's not sorted. So I found from experience that it's quicker to um, scan it and then save it in the right place rather than... Uh, you know just scan it all and then and then hope that someone in history will sort it out later uh, because there's a lot of context isn't there I mean you know there's a lot of uh, you know I mean it'd just be easy for me to do it because some researcher coming along in 50 years time who God forbid has got the job of trying to make some sense out of all this archive material is not really going to have the context uh, to know what's what in the same way as we don't know what colour the dinosaurs are or uh, you know uh, there's a ton of historical stuff that's been lost and can never be known because nobody ever recorded it at contemporaneously so that's going to be I'm going to devote most of my time I think now as far as the GDPA is concerned just to archiving it and um, making it making it available so that as a sociological phenomenon it's open to analysis and also open to uh, uh, of some interest I think to dentists to see how uh, the earliest uh, association dedicated really to NHS practitioners NHS general dental practitioners uh, worked you know how how, the, how a trade union was formed of people who uh, were effectively had socialized health care imposed upon them and uh, you know quite and did quite well in the early years and then then extremely badly in the latter years so um, I don't think I'm going to need to appeal for resources the British Dental Trade Association under Tony Reid offered I think it wasn't a massive amount it was about two and two and a half thousand pounds or something mainly for us to buy a fast scanner to uh, archive these records and then when we came to uh, when we asked them for the money there it wasn't there so I think we'd written something funny about them in, in the magazine along the lines of um, you know that they're not really uh, charitable unless it suits their bottom line so we wrote an article saying that to the extent that companies um, adopt a charity or uh, associate themselves with a charity it's with a view to being seen to be more public spirited in other words to help their brand oh and did they not like that and, you know did they not like that so. so that was it then they they had a closed doors meeting and I think at that point they decided to not support us in any way at all to have nothing to do with us and so as a result uh, don't know whether the funding was stopped directly or indirectly but either way they didn't make up they didn't come through on the promise to uh, to do it so what else I mean talking of you know I mean and and, and the GDPA really as I was saying the other day did cover there has covered the period of um, of dentists doing well to it, it all turn into doodle So it's quite an interesting period, you know, of a decline in a service that was a very sort of uh, almost uh, too far up itself in terms of its importance. You know, it saw itself as as the second emergency service, and um, and, uh, and now has ended up really grubbing around for pennies. You know, on the from the state. The. I don't know what the situation is with you are. I mean, we are have two commission practices in East Kent, which is a large area. I mean, obviously it's not as large as Yorkshire, but I mean, 
there's a lot of population in there, you know, there's Margate, Ramsgate, Folkestone, Dover, uh, Ashford, uh, Maidstone, all these large towns, large towns, and two uh, commission practices in the east of the county, and uh, one of them shut down and the patients were reallocated, and the other one uh, was going to be shut down a year later, but has been given a stay of execution because of the outcry that occurred. The, what the patients have done with the first practice, the Church Hill practice in Ramsgate, is what I can tell is that for the most part they've done nothing. And you would think that, um, you know, and most of the local dentists took out adverts in the local newspaper uh, saying, look, you know, we're here, we're here, if you want to register with us, uh, not on the NHS privately, you know, but we are, you know, the, but you've got no choice in effect, you know, your NHS practice is shut, so if you want to get on our books, you can. And um, without, you know, much in the way of success, to be honest, um, the people who, the, the momentum builds up slowly if a practice shuts. Almost nothing happens, you know, like nothing happens immediately. Uh, you might think that as soon as there's the first whisper that an NHS practice is going to shut, the, the, the savvy patients, you know, the ones who are old and wise, they'll know, they'll think, well, I'll, I'll get in ahead of this, you know, I'll, I'll register. Let me just get my, put my wing wear out. They'll think I'll oh, get ahead of this and, and register somewhere else, you know, and perhaps they did, but they won't have gone to NHS, uh, private practices, they'll have gone to NHS practices, of which there was only one other, and that one was inundated, you know, because the, um, <clears throat> the NHS really, the, to, to, to all extents, owns the goodwill of these practices, which has been a lesson to dentists, because, you know, as a dentist, you think that you own the goodwill. Uh, but as an NHS dentist, you used to own the goodwill, but you don't now. You won't, well, at least if you're, a, if you're a practitioner, you own the goodwill. But where, you, where you're being, you know, directed to practice, and where you're being told which patients you can take on, and where you're, you're practicing grass a la local authority because they're paying you, you know, they're sorting out your premises, etc., etc., then it's not your goodwill, it's their goodwill. And if they decide to close the practice, then they direct their patients to scatter to the four winds. You know, they don't say, oh, we've, uh, you know, we suggest you do this, that, or the other. They basically, they say, no, you will need to make alternative arrangements. Well, there are none, you know, there are none. There are, there's just a website that says uh, NHS England has a, a, an obligation to place you at a dentist if you need one. And if they don't, then you need to complain to the NHS England or the public ombudsman, a health ombudsman. I mean, and that, what use is that to a woman who's fallen over and cracked her front tooth and, and needs to have her front tooth uh, put back, repair? So the second commission practice, I mean, and basically it's NHS England that shut the practice. I mean, there's an article in the paper uh, or on the Google News today about a guy uh, in Haywards Heath, I think, that's complaining that uh, his local my dentist is shut and that he's, he's flooded with patients. And I assume, I mean, he must be in NHS practice because he talks about having the capacity to see 8,500 patients and uh, now having 9,500 patients on the books and not being able to accept any more. Um, I mean, I don't know whether he's angling to get a larger contract. I mean, I don't think, I think that the local authority probably would have considered giving him a larger contract when they, they shut the My Dentist, unless My Dentist then, you know, just said, sorry guys, we're, we're just closing, we don't care about your contract. That's the, that's the thing, you know, old, old Barry Cockcroft, he was a big fan of the corporates and, you know, was quite frequently, his diary was, had, a, had lunch with some bloody corporate booked in. If you, when we requested his movements under the Freedom of Information, he got wined and dined a lot, and uh, he loved the corporates, and um, and has in fact uh, left, and I think went to work for one as a 
and an executive director, I think, of, of my dentist. But they are, um, how can I put it? They're like, uh, you can get burned, you know? If the government says no, we'd rather have one contract with a practice, with, with a group that's got a thousand practices than a thousand contracts with a thousand different individual dentists, then okay, that's fine. You know, the economies of scale and all that and uh, cronyism and all that, but then if this monster that you've created, this Frankenstein's monster that you've created, turns around and says, you know, we're going to drop you in the clerk politically because we're closing a practice in, a, in what is, uh, what Barry would have called a totemic area, you know, something somewhere where people will, where it will hit the fan and people will get upset, then there's not much you can do because they've got, you've got, you know, the government did it because the government thought they would have a lot of leverage over the corporates. And uh, now it's, they're finding out that the corporates have turned the tables and the corporates have more leverage over them. So we're getting, as I say, it's a slow process. The uh, You get a, a period of uh, like a phony war, and then as people get toothache and realise that you know they might try and ring their old number to see what's going on, and then find out that it's it's coming up unobtainable, um, and then they start ringing round, and then then one by one they very quickly come to the realisation that uh, there's all the NHS in the area has just packed up and gone home on the grounds of lack of profitability, and this is the market winning out. You know it's. It's, um, this is something we've said oh, for 30, 40 years. It, you can't, uh, Stephen Tidman always used to say, you know, that this is a monopsony, what he called it a monopsony, which is basically like a monopoly, except that instead of one person having a monopoly on, on the production, one, one entity has a monopsony on the purchasing. In other words, they're the only person who's purchasing this thing. So really, the, you know, they like to think the boot's on the other foot and they can buy it for what they like because if you want to sell it, you can only sell it to them. And that's, that is with NHS dentistry. That's the, the NHS is the only buyer of NHS dentistry. So if dentists want to work on the NHS, they have to work for the NHS. And I think they misunderstood this. I think they thought that uh, that would give them godlike powers over the workforce. And in fact, it hasn't at all. What they, they, they use that monopsony to try and dictate prices. And as someone famous once said, you can't buck the market. If it costs £100 to provide a filling, then you can't provide a filling for less than £100 for very long. Well, I mean, they have done it for a long time, but they've done it by just subsidising with public money. And that is a strategy that works only so long as the public money keeps flowing. Um, sooner or later the market dictates that the public money runs out because you can't just print prosperity you can't print money to carry on subsidizing your collectivist approach you know your socialist approach to healthcare. It, at the end of the day it costs what it costs now what they've done is they've um, you know that there's a lot of good dentists who could work privately who aren't because they're being undercut left right and center by the NHS and the patients, you know, they're, they're all like, well, why should I pay you, um, why should I pay you £2,000 to have a four unit bridge done when, you know, I can get it done for £300 on the NHS? So, the question is why <clears throat> have they managed to kill off the, the private sector? They've managed to suppress it, I think, yes, they have managed to suppress it. But now that the NHS sector is falling apart, I think that it's becoming increasingly obvious that the private sector is is going to start moving forward. You know, it's been waiting. You know, it's been just about managing and thriving and, and sort of uh, thriving on people who sort of whose parents have died, who've got a bit of cash, want to get their teeth sorted out. The typical patient, people who have got toothache, who got to pay a hundred quid to have a tooth out because they're in agony. That sort of thing. That's kept us going. But now we're getting more and more people who are like, you know, are you taking on patients? And they're coming to us from the, the private sector because I think I, I'm, 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 and we've been looking for evidence of capitulation for a long time on behalf of the public. But I think I'm starting to see the early signs of capitulation. 
You know, the NHS has run out of options. This is a very local thing and it may not be happening near you. I mean, it just happens to be happening near me at the moment. And uh, this, the funny thing about dentistry it is so localized, you know? And I think the, the Department of Health sort of took advantage of that. They were like, well, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. Let's just find out where the problems are locally and just whack them. And they used to whack them with money and, and surgeries. And now they're finding out that these surgeries are, are just money pits. Uh, we all know that. I mean, <laughs> anyone who runs a dental surgery knows it's a money pit. And, um, and so locally, they're now, they're just closing them down. And I think they're just closing them down one, one at a time locally and, and again, just dealing with the, any problems uh, that the patients are presenting uh, locally, one at a time. But the, the problems that the patients are having is really um, to, um, you know, is, is the realization that they're gonna have to get themselves uh, booked in with a private dentist at some point right okay that's my thought for today and uh, I'll keep in touch I might I might um, I might suggest that people sort of sponsor the um, effort to archive the GDPA records um, in return for access to them you know I, I mean in the end I think this is all going to be public access and if you want to wait until it's done and then and it's released then that's fine but if you want sort of early access to the stuff as it's scanned and it will be scanned and uploaded um, then, um, then get in touch and perhaps we can uh, afford to um, pay someone else to do it. And in which case it will get done quicker, believe me. All right, I'll talk to you later. Bye.